And this is one of those Sundays when I would just sit down, shut up, and let them sing. You were a little more excited about that than I'm happy with, I just got to say. Uh, it's good to see you all this morning. We're glad you're here. We're in week five of our series, Creating a New Normal, where hopefully we are all learning together and being encouraged that we can make significant and lasting changes in our life. We can move past the struggles of our past. We can move past our bad decisions. We can even move past pain that's been inflicted on us in our lives. Even if it was pain that came at the hands of somebody that we are or at one point we're close to. But that doesn't mean those kind of changes are going to be easy. We're going to have to leave those memories and those hurt feelings behind, and that's hard. There is no three-step process to creating this new normal life. It just doesn't exist. And those who offer it on social media or in their books that they write are just this generation's snake oil salesmen. I think it was Teddy Roosevelt who said, nothing worth having in this life comes easy. And I agree. When we begin this work of creating a new normal, we discover that it is work. There are complexities and there are obstacles that we never considered before in getting to that new place. But we've got to work through them if we're going to grow and if we're going to change. That's true even with seemingly basic things in life like gratitude, which is what we'll talk about today. It, it sounds so simple on the surface to just say we need to be grateful as people. Or to read some of Paul's writing in the New Testament where he says things like this. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. Always give thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's tough to be grateful when you've lost your job. It's tough when you've lost your health. It's tough to be grateful when you've lost someone you love. But Paul doesn't leave us a whole lot of wiggle room in this command in Scripture. Always give thanks for everything. Some things in life are clear-cut decisions. There's no gray. There's no middle ground. There's no compromise. There's an A or there's a B choice. And I have come to the place in my life where I believe gratitude is one of those things. We have two paths before us in this life that we can choose from. If we want to be a healthier, happier, more joy-filled person. We can choose to live entitled lives, believing that this world and everyone in it owes us. When we live that way, it doesn't take long to discover that that choice simply turns our hearts angry and bitter and resentful. The clear other choice, and it's a choice we have to make if we say we want to follow Jesus, is the clear path ahead of choosing gratitude. Unbelievable. Now, actually, after 13 years of listening to Michael pull this kind of stuff off, it's very believable, right? <laughs> Michael and the whole group did amazing this morning. So All right, now it's going to get ugly because I'm going to ask you how you did on your homework. Last week, we talked about boundaries. I gave you two very clear things, at least in my head, it was clear that I wanted you to do this week. How'd you do on them? If you weren't here, you'd get a pass, unless, of course, you listen to the podcast and you don't get a pass. But first thing I asked you to do was to track how many times you told a lie this week. Specifically, like when somebody said, hey, you want to go to that restaurant we love, you said, sure, when you really didn't want to, or somebody asked you to stay late after work and you lied about it and just went, you sure that'll be fine when you had other obligations. So that little lie tells us that we're not doing good boundaries. And the other is, the one that'll help us begin to set those boundaries, I ask you to say no to something every day. Say no to the kid who makes a request that's unreasonable. Say no to the boss that asks you to stay late after work. Just say no when somebody asks you for a foot rub. It's just weird. You'd be proud of me. Darren ask. I said no. It's a line I'm not willing to cross. 
No, he didn't. So it's tough work. It's necessary if we're going to set good boundaries. But this morning is all about gratitude. And I'll give you a warning. I'm going to ask you to do some homework there, too, as well. Gratitude's a hot topic in our culture. Type it in in Google's search engine, and you get 153 million hits in less than a second. Type it into Amazon, search books on the topic of gratitude. More than 40,000 resources show up. Not all of them are good, but there's a lot that are really, really solid. It's a hot topic. In most major religions of the world, gratitude is viewed as a highly prized human disposition. And yet in spite of all that, I think we have a bit of a fuzzy, squishy definition in our heads of what it means to be grateful. Boiled down to its simplest, clearest definition, gratitude is a willful recognition that I've received something I did not earn, I do not merit, and I do not deserve. The consensus throughout the world, Christian and non-Christian, is that we are morally obligated not just to feel gratitude, but to express it when we have been given something that benefits us. Gratitude at its core actually requires us to show appreciation in a tangible way for something that's been done for us. There's a great example of that in the Old Testament uh, with King David. He was the second king of Israel, and he was chosen at eight, nine, ten years old as a shepherd boy. God said, you will be the next king. Samuel anointed him with oil, said, you will be the next king of Israel. Now, his journey from a little boy to king at 30 years old it was a rough journey. He spent most of the first 30 years of his life as a wanted man, hiding, on the run, often in enemy territory, because King Saul had grown to view David as a threat, as a problem, as an annoyance, and so he sent his best military men out to search down, to find, and to kill David. So over 15 to 20 years, that was David's life. He was a man on the run. Now eventually, Saul, along with his sons and any other suitors for the throne were killed in battle. And when the dust settled and David was sitting on the throne, he turned to his advisors and asked, is there any, uh, anybody, anyone at all in Saul's family who's still alive? Is there anyone to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Jonathan was Saul's son. He was the heir apparent to the throne. He was also David's closest friend. And David had this clear recognition in these words that he would not be where he was as king if Jonathan had not conspired against his father, if Jonathan hadn't protected him from Saul's murderous attempts and threats. So in gratitude, decades later, David looks for and finds Jonathan's only living relative to show gratitude to him for Jonathan's kindness. A kindness that David didn't earn and he didn't deserve. And so he called in this man who was named Ziba, who um, was one of Saul's servants in his court when Saul was king. And David asked him, he said, is there anyone still alive from Saul's family? If so, I want to show God's kindness to them. Yep, said Ziba. One of Jonathan's sons is alive, but he's crippled in both feet. Now, if you go a little further back in Samuel and you, you read the story, what happened was when Jonathan and Saul were killed in battle, that uh, Jonathan's son, Mephibosheth, was in the palace. And his nurse, who cared for him, was so concerned for their life as things crumbled around them that she grabbed Mephibosheth and they began to run for literally for their lives. Somewhere along the way, something happened. We're not given the details, but Mephibosheth fell and ended up crippled for his life in both of his feet. Where is he, the king asked, in Lodabar. Now, that doesn't, like, mean a lot to us. That'd be like, you know, saying he's in Crystal Lake because we don't understand the meaning of that Hebrew word. 
instantly David knew that Mephibosheth had hit rock bottom. I mean, the ancient world wasn't especially kind to people with physical challenges. And he is the son of a prior king. And so he's in hiding, living in Lodabar, which in, in, in English, if we translated it, would be saying he lives in the land of nothing. Well, that's not a great address. I mean, it'd be like living in dismal Tennessee or peculiar Missouri or my personal favorite, Boogertown, North Carolina. Nobody wants that on their birth certificate, right? I was born in Chicago. Well, I was born in Boogertown. I could have kind of guessed by your personality. I really could. So Mephibosheth is living in Lodabar, and he has to be terrified to learn that this new king wants to see him. It had been a long time. He left the palace at five. He's a grown man with a grown son and a family of his own. <laughs> and he was well aware of what new kings did to the members of the old king's family. So when he walked in to see David, he had to be, well, he didn't walk in, he was crippled in his feet. When he's brought in to see David, he had to be terrified. And David recognizes that and just says, look, don't be afraid. I intend to show kindness to you because of my promise to your father, Jonathan. I will give you, get this, I will give you all the property that once belonged to your grandfather, Saul. All that property. And you will eat here with me at the king's table. And that's exactly what happened. David followed through on this commitment. He became, Meshibapheth became a recipient of David's gratitude. And this poor crippled man all of a sudden became this wealthy landowner. And every day he ate at the king's table seats that were reserved for decorated war heroes and diplomats. And he ate there not because he deserved it. He had all that land not because he earned it. He got it as a gift from a grateful king. A willful recognition on David's part that without Jonathan's help, he would not have lived to his 30th birthday. You know, there are dozens of stories like this in Scripture where people show this willful recognition of something they've received that they didn't earn, they didn't merit, they don't deserve. There are 50 times in the New Testament alone that we are commanded to be thankful Paul's the most prolific writer on it. He says, in everything, in everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. You, you, you don't have to be grateful for the circumstance you're in, but be grateful that God is going to see you through it. Whatever you do, Paul says, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Whatever you do, be grateful. The Bible does its best to, con to convince us that a grateful life is the best life. And then you add to that the, the huge volume of research articles and studies that have been done on gratitude, and they confirm everything the Bible teaches. One of the scientific studies that I scanned this week uh, was looking at the impact of gratitude, what it does in our lives. And so they had the control group, and then they had the study group. And what they asked the study group to do was to journal things they were grateful for every day. And after a period of months, they did a whole battery of tests and determined that the grateful people showed more determination in life. Their enthusiasm, their energy for life increased just by being grateful. They reported they had fewer aches and pains. And the symptoms of depression and anxiety some of them had been feeling were fading away. They were more optimistic as an individual. And what was crazy was that if they were married, without telling their spouse that they were in a study like this, without telling their spouse what the practice was, their spouses reported that they were markedly different and better. And my favorite benefit that came out of the study was everybody who did the journaling on gratitude slept better. Now, I could go for a better night's sleep. I don't know about you. Um, but that's a huge benefit. There is great power in us being grateful in our life. And it's tough 
to be grateful at times. It, it's tough to kick the painful memories and experiences out of our mind. They seem to dig in and find a home there. The conclusion of one study, I love the conclusion of this one study, was a sentence, the mind is like Velcro for negative experiences and Teflon for positive ones. It's just the nature of our brain. Maybe that's why this gratitude thing can be so hard is because our brains are naturally wired to just hang on to the tough stuff and dwell on it. So the real question for me this morning is how do I retrain my brain? How do you retrain your brain to be more grateful, to let the good stuff stick and slide the bad stuff on out? So let me offer some simple practices we can do that will help us take forward steps in gratitude. The one is to do what those adults were asked to do in that study. I would encourage you just to begin a simple journal and every day list five new things for which you're grateful. This is a cumulative list. You don't repeat the same things every day. So today, before you go to bed, in your phone, on your computer, on your tablet, in an old school uh, spiral bound notebook, grab a pen and write out five things that you were grateful for today. The brain only has so much power to focus its attention. And some of us have less power to focus than others, let's be fair. But the truth is, no matter where we are on that continuum, our brain struggles to focus on positive things and negative things at the same time. So when we choose to see the good, our mind will weed out the bad. On top of that, our brain has this thing built into it called a confirmation bias and it automatically our brains will automatically look for evidence to confirm what we already believe is true maybe that's why God encourages us to fix our thoughts on what is true what is honorable what's right and pure and lovely and admirable think about things God says that are excellent and worthy of praise. Anything in your life right now that fits one of those words? Be grateful. So at the start of or at the end of your day, for the rest of the month of February, I would love for you to just write down five things every day, five new things for which you are grateful. Here's the cool thing. If you just do that simple exercise, by the end of February, you're going to have a list that's over 100 items long just in February. And it's not that tough. In fact, you'll find every day that you do this, it gets easier. Because once we start expressing gratitude, our brain starts looking even more for things to be grateful for. Now, the second thing I would encourage you to do is, uh, as you're being grateful, don't be picky. Appreciate everything. There is nothing too small for us to be thankful for. It. How many of you said a prayer of thanks this week for Friedlib Ferdinand Rungi. Anybody? Seriously. You have no idea the impact this man has had on your life. I mean, your, your whole life is better because of him. Our Sunday morning experience this morning is better because of him. The band was better this morning because of Rungi. Why? Because he was the scientist who accidentally discovered caffeine. <laughs> ah, see? Now you're grateful, right? Can I get an amen for Rungi? No. We owe this man a huge debt. Friday was his birthday. And they said he celebrated with a quad shot latte at Starbucks. Which is pretty amazing because he's 225 years old. So the coffee was good for him. Hey, while we're on the coffee thing, I also, and Darren said this is a children's story. I have no idea. I think he's making this up, okay? But I heard a guy give a TED Talk, and if it's on the Internet, it has to be true. So he said that he had been going to the same coffee shop every day for years, and it was consistently the best cup of coffee that he ever had anywhere in all of his travels. And so he just decided one morning that he needed to just tell the barista how much he loved the coffee. Beyond the cursory, hey, thanks, man, have a good day. He stopped and he said, no, I really want you to know this is the best cup of coffee, consistently the best cup of coffee I find anywhere. 
Barista went, no, you know, I mean, thanks, but really the person you should be thanking is the roaster because they go to great extent to make sure that the coffee is consistently good. And he went, huh. So he tracked down the roaster and he heard the story about that and he thanked the roaster and the roaster was like, well, really, I mean, it all starts with these people who live in Central Africa and take great pride in the coffee beans that they grow and the quality of the beans and the care that they give them and picking them at just the right time and the whole process that goes into it. So this guy, uh, contrary to Darren's cynicism, this guy traveled the world coming up with who was responsible for his cup of coffee. He traveled to that village in Africa where most of those beans were grown and he thanked them. And then he found the dairy farmers that produced the cream that went in his coffee and the sugar cane growers that produced the sugar that went in his coffee. And he said over the course of this entire thing, he started to realize it wasn't just his barista, that the entire world was working together to produce a consistently good cup of coffee for him every morning. Uh, while he is a wee bit narcissistic, he's grateful. It's a beautiful story. So how about you? How many of you lost your power in the ice storm this week? Anybody? We're like three and four. That's amazing. I really thought there'd be more. When was the last time you lost your power? Was your immediate response when your electric went off that you were grateful? No. How many of us stopped in that moment to be grateful for the people who are working to restore our power. But when the thunderstorm takes out the power, they're out in the middle of it, repairing so that we can get electricity, so we can get back to our popcorn and our Netflix. Just be grateful. There's always something to be thankful in life. We just need to train our brain to see it. I'm thankful for a 19-year-old car that starts on 30 below zero mornings. I'm thankful for the unconditional love of a dog. I'm thankful for the fickle love of a cat. I'm grateful for the laughter of a baby, for children who do their chores, for hus husband, no, we'll stop. Um, <laughs> be thankful. There's always something to be thankful for. And if you're having a tough time figuring out what those things are, might I suggest a third exercise, and that's begin to limit, limit the negative input into your life. Find those people, find those sources of negative input, and just start weeding them out. They're a buzzkill. A few months back, I decided to take control of Facebook, my personal Facebook, not the company. And I realized that I had this option that if somebody was being overly negative, in the stuff they posted, I could snooze them for 30 days and they'd never know it. <laughs> Their posts would just stop showing up in my Facebook. And when they reappeared 30 days later, if they were still negative, if that wasn't just a blip on their radar, I could unfollow them. And it doesn't take a lot of courage to do it because they'll never know that I've ever done that. I mean, obviously I'd never do it to any of you, but you can limit that negative input. And all of a sudden, my Facebook page is more positive. It's more thoughtful than it was before. One of the biggest negative inputs into my life is news. I am a news junkie. If I have my preference on a six-hour road trip, I would listen to news for six hours straight. But then I started to realize a lot of the news is just toxic. It's negative. And so I've made the decision in my life to limit that to just a few minutes in the morning. I have my morning ritual of my quiet time, my journaling, and, and then I'll listen to about five to ten minutes, no more than 15 minutes of news, and I'm done. My life is so much better for rooting out those negative inputs into my life. One more. If you want to experience more gratitude, begin to slow down and enjoy whatever experience you are in. Put away your phone. Put away its camera. 
In fact, I've gotten to where if I'm having lunch with somebody, I flip the phone over so I can't even see the screen. I turn it on silent. Whatever is there will wait because the person in front of me is far more important than that device. Put it away and be fully present in your everyday experiences. Savor every moment of every conversation. If you're having breakfast with somebody tomorrow morning in a restaurant, drink in the sounds and the smells. Watch the people around you. Be fully immersed in that experience and give thanks for the good stuff that happens. And if it's the person you're with that you're thankful for, take a moment to just tell them how grateful you are for their presence in your life. You know, I, I would encourage you strongly, pick up one or two of these practices. Put them into your life this week. Take whatever steps would be helpful for you to grow in gratitude. We're going to do one of those together this morning. We're going to switch things up just a little bit as we end the service. We celebrate communion here at Westridge every single week, and I love that. But anything that we do in our lives on a routine basis has the potential of being taken for granted. I mean, there are Sundays, I'll just confess, there's so much going on. I, I'm in so many meetings and conversations and things that I get to communion, and I hurry through it. It's almost like I'm just taking my morning medicine. You know, there's a wafer and there's juice, and I'm done, and I go on my way. Not often, but it happens. And I'm sure you're there too. So this morning, I want us to slow down and savor this experience, maybe more than we usually do, and be deeply grateful. Gratitude was at the heart of Jesus establishing this Lord's Supper for us. The Bible says in Matthew 26, when he was around the table with his disciples for the Passover meal, he paused, he picked up the bread. The Bible says he held it up, and when he had given thanks to God the Father, he pulled that bread down, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, take this and eat it. It represents my body that's going to be broken for you. He did the same with the cup of juice that was on the table. He lifted it up, and after he had given thanks, he passed it around and said, drink from this, all of you, because it represents my blood that's going to be shed for you. Gratitude is at the heart of this celebration of communion. So as we celebrate this morning, Slow down your RPMs. Take a deep, cleansing breath. Maybe take the bread and the cup and hold them a little longer than usual to think, to focus. Celebrate the goodness of, your, of God in your life and give thanks. Let your grateful heart sweep over your past week like a magnet collecting things to be grateful for. For the beauty of a sunset. For the glory of a full moon. For the miracle of muscles around our eyes that enable us to focus and see and drink in the beauty of God's creation. Thank you, Lord. For our lungs that will inhale and exhale about 11,000 liters of air every single day for a heart in our chest that will beat 3 billion times before we die. For a brain that's its own supercomputer processing thousands of data points of input every single second. Thank you, God. For the jam on our morning toast, for milk, on our cereal, for a blanket that calms us, for a joke that delights us, for a 50-degree day in January in Chicago. Thank you, God. For husbands and wives who choose to forgive each other and grow deeper in love, and for kids who took the time to show love to their parents. Thank you, God. Reflect on your blessings. Rehearse God's accomplishment and be still enough in this moment not just to appreciate the good gift, but the good gift giver. And if you find nothing else to be thankful for as you celebrate communion this morning, you can be thankful for this, that God in his grace and mercy has given us the greatest gift that we will ever receive in our lives. 
Jesus died and rose again so that you and I could have our sins forgiven and could live free. It was an unmerited gift. It was an unearned gift. It was an undeserved gift. Thank you, God. Would you pray with me? God, in the busyness of our day, we just confess to you that sometimes we forget to stop and thank you for all that is good in our lives. Our blessings are many, God, and our hearts are filled with gratitude for life, for the ability to love and be loved, for the opportunity to see every day the wonders of your creation, for sleep, for water, for food, for a mind that thinks and a body that feels. Thank you. And God, as tough as it is, we also thank you for those things in our life that are less than we had hoped they would be, for things that seem challenging and unfair and difficult. And when our heart feels stretched and empty, God, and the pool of tears forms in our weary eyes, help us to rejoice that you are as near to us as our next breath. In the silence of our soul, in the quiet of these moments, God, we thank you most of all for your unconditional and eternal